check. Dr. Chandra, it's over. A very warm welcome to the SLVA CPD webinar series. We're yet again bringing to you another CPD webinar. This time it is on hip dysplasia, organized as usual by the Sri Lanka Veterans Association. Well, this program is a little bit special as it is the 21st and also the final webinar series, final webinar of the CPD series brought to you by the Sri Lanka Veterans Association. Well, if I'm to brief you about the Sri Lanka Veterans Association, the SLVA is the professional body serving and representing the interests of the veteran profession in Sri Lanka with more than 1,000 members and was established in 1940. Well, the association is committed to excellence, excellence within the profession and works towards the enhancement of the quality of the profession and the well being of animals. It promotes public awareness, contribution of animals and veterinarians of Sri Lanka, and also to the entire Sri Lankan society. The SLV looks forward to serving veterinarians of Sri Lanka for years to come. So today, as another service to the veterinary profession of Sri Lanka, the SLV has organized a webinar on a very timely and attractive topic, which is on hip dysplasia, diagnosis and treatment. Well, before we move on with the agenda, I shall make it a point to welcome participants, not only from Sri Lanka, but, of, but across the globe. We are broadcasting this webinar by YouTube as a live session, and we have more than 600 participants joining with us from Singapore, Thailand, Malaysia, United States, United Kingdom, United Arab Emirates, Australia, and many African countries. So it is a pleasure to welcome all of you to the CPD session on hip dysplasia. In order to formally welcome the participants, let me invite the president of the Sri Lanka Veterans Association, Dr. Randika Gurwardhana, to address the gathering. Dr. Randika, the screen is all yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Chandridu. I mean, uh, yeah, without taking much your time, so we warmly welcome actually my dear teachers uh, are here and uh, other, other veterinary colleagues from all over the world and from local environments. Good morning to you all, good afternoon, and good evening to you all, especially who are joining with us from overseas. And today, actually, uh, we have a very interesting topic uh, hip dysplasia in, in, in our local country, veterinarians also. We can grab a lot of messages today, take more messages today, I'm sure. And uh, actually, uh, we, we were compelled to shift to our CPD series into webinar structure because due to the pandemic situation, but it was promisingly highly successful. And we, we, we were able to record actually 20 webinars. And this is the last and the 21st webinar we are conducting today. And I also want to uh, welcome today. We are, uh, she's joining with us here today from the World Veterinary Association, the, the president, uh, Dr. Patricia T Dr. T Turner, actually. And uh, the president-elect also will be joining here with us today. So they recognize our webinar series as a highly, highly standard and uh, timely organized uh, event uh, for the current, current year calendar. And uh, without taking much of your time, I welcome you all today for this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Arandika. Well, as... Uh, Dr. Arandika, please, yeah. Yeah, yes, Dr. Yes, Dr. Arandi, thank you very much. Uh, as Dr. Arandi rightly mentioned, uh, it's quite an honor to have the president of the World Veterans Association here with us today. And uh, now we'll be joined with uh, Dr. Patricia Turner, the president of the World Veterans Association. Her, and I'm president of the World Veterans. 
by breathing. And associated challenges have made it difficult for things to network for the past 18 months. Despite this, organizations such as this one have been able to pivot and adapt to offer high quality virtual programs to ensure that their membership professionals from around the world are able to make education is a key strategic priority for the WVA and it is critical that veterinarians be able to support their communities and their clients by offering up-to-date competent care treatment and advice for their animals to all the best families to stay safe and healthy in the coming months and I look forward to a time when we can all meet again in person thank you Yes, my name is Dr. Pat Turner. Thank you very much. That was the message uh, from the president of the World Veterans Association, Dr. Patricia Turner. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to commence the session. Well, I need to remind you a few housekeeping rules before we start the mm -hmm. session on uh, hip dysplasia. All participants are kindly requested to mute their microphones when the resource person is speaking. And if there is any question, you can type them in in the chat box or ask them during the question and answer session, which would take place right after the lecture. Well, let me now invite the secretary of the Sri Lanka Veterans Association, Dr. Sugat Premachandra, to introduce the resource personnel of today's session. Dr. Sugat, screen is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chandi uh, It's a pleasure to introduce our resource person today, Dr. Mahika Seniuratna. Dr. Mahika graduated from the University of Cambridge in 2014. She then spent a year in practice in Sri Lanka before returning to UK to complete a rotating internship in small animal medicine and surgery at the Royal Veterans College, London. Mahika then went on to complete a European College of Veterinary Surgery approved residency at the Royal Veterinary College London from 2018 to 2021. Uh, Dr. Mahika Senoratna is one of the very famous and talented veterinarian in Sri Lanka. On behalf of Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, I would like to invite Dr. Mahika Senoratna to continue the webinar. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, let me just start to share my screen. Okay, so hopefully that should be clear enough. Um, so as we've said today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about canine hip dysplasia. I think it's quite an important topic to think about in Sri Lanka, given the fact that we have quite a lot of large breed dogs. And from what I can see, an increase in the number of large breed purebred puppies that we are starting to see. Um, so hopefully this will be quite timely and useful as well. So I'm just going to start by talking a little bit about the etiopathogenesis of the disease. Then we'll go on to presentation and clinical signs, um, some diagnostic imaging, and then I'll focus the majority of the talk on, managing, on the medical management of these cases um, prior to briefly mentioning some surgical options that are available to us in Sri Lanka. Uh, so really, what is hip dysplasia? Hip dysplasia, if you want to think about it quite simply, if you think of the hip as a ball and socket joint, hip dysplasia is basically, the way I think about it, is a mismatch between the ball and the socket component. So the femoral head and the acetabulum. Um, so this is a, it's one of the most common orthopedic conditions that we diagnose in dogs, and a prevalence of up to 71% has been seen in affected breeds. Um, so the most common breeds that you might see it in are Labradors, Rottweilers, German Shepherds, and Golden Retrievers after the breeds we see in Sri Lanka. It's also been diagnosed in smaller breed dogs now like Bulldogs and Pugs. Um, we don't really know exactly how this comes about, but it is thought that some laxity that's present in the, present, uh, that's present in the developing hip joint um, leads to abnormal wearing of the joint and then subsequently osteoarthritis. It is a polygenic disease, so there's many genes that each contribute a very small effect. 
Um, and the individual phenotype, so that is whether an individual will exhibit signs of hip dysplasia or laxity, will, um, so, sorry, signs of hip laxity or osteoarthritis, will depend on the individual's genotype, so the genes, or external environmental factors. So just to focus a little bit about the, uh, uh, on the external environmental factors, because these are things that maybe we could influence as veterinarians in the growing stages of these puppies. So um, this table just highlights some risk factors that have been shown. So excessive food consumption, a rapid gain in weight, excessive calcium supplementation, a dietary anion gap or early age neuter have been um, implicated. Um, I'll talk about the nutritional factors a little bit more in the next slide. But just to mention about neutering, um, it's important to note that it is not just neutering these dogs, but it's actually early age neutering that has been has been um, suggested as a possible risk factor. And this is something just to keep in mind if you're neutering a large breed dog that's, being, um, that's predisposed to hip dysplasia, you might want to wait till they're skeletally mature. Um, so just a little bit about the nutrition. Firstly, unrestricted calorie intake has been shown to increase the incidence of hip dysplasia in puppies. So it's important to limit calorie consumption and uh, limit excessive growth and ex excessive weight gain. Um, but more importantly, the, uh, a balanced diet is really, really critical. So excessive cal calcium has been clearly shown to be detrimental. Um, so we want to make sure that our large breed puppies have a balanced diet that has a correct calcium phosphorus ratio. Again, this is just to highlight in Sri Lankan conditions, a lot of these dogs are fed home cooked diets. We, the key point is that these diets contain an unknown level of calcium. We know that home cooked diets generally tend to be um, higher in phosphorus and low in calcium, but we don't know for sure. And therefore, it's important to realize that when we supplement these with commercial calcium supplements, we don't really know the original levels of calcium. So we could be over supplementing or we could be under supplementing, both of which are really not ideal. Um, so for me, what this means is that a large breed growing puppy really needs to be on a balanced commercial large breed puppy diet, at least till they reach skeletal maturity of two years of age. It's important that these puppy diets are then not supplemented with commercial supplements because they have the correct amount of calcium and they, should, they don't need any more. Um, and this is again important to think about when we supplement dairy products, for example. So a lot of people believe that puppies need milk. Um, that's not really true for a variety of reasons, but when speaking about hip dysplasia in particular, we could be over supplementing calcium without realizing it. Um, and again, feeding very high carbohydrate diets like a large portion of large quantities of rice, again, will be detrimental in terms of excessive weight gain. Um, so for me, a balanced commercial large breed puppy diet and no additional supplements it would, is quite essential in the growing stages. Um, so coming on to the signament, these cases usually present, um, the juvenile condition will present usually between four to 12 months of age. We can diagnose hip dysplasia in older dogs, and these would be um, cases that are presenting due to secondary arthritis. Um, so some of, some of these cases are dogs where early signs are not noted, or these are dogs that actually end up only showing signs once they develop secondary arthritis and don't show signs initially due to the joint laxity. Um, it's important to be mindful when we are considering dogs that are um, that older dogs that present due to arthritis. These dogs will usually present with a very gradual onset. So just, just keep in mind that an older dog presenting with an acute onset lameness may not be presenting for hip dysplasia, even though they have may have signs on x-rays. So it's important to think about other things that might be causing this. Um, again, I mentioned predisposed breeds, so usually large breed dogs, German Shepherd, Labradors, Rottweilers being most common in Sri Lanka, and there isn't a sex predilection uh, identified with the disease. Uh, so your lameness exam will be your initial part, the first part of your orthopedic exam. Generally, these cases have uh, bilateral presentations, but um, however, they can be worse on one side that, give light, that gives rise to a unilateral lameness. The initial signs can be fairly nonspecific. So early on, they can have a reduction in exercise tolerance. They can be reluctant to climb stairs and a difficulty lying down or rising, especially in the mornings or late evenings can be quite a common thing. Um, specific to the hind limb, owners may perceive an audible click or a clunk when they're walking. Owners also may, um, may perceive some hip pain. Um, you can have some bilateral or unilateral hind limb atrophy. And again, if one side is worse, you might have unilateral lameness. 
Specific gear, gear abnormalities have been identified. And again, here you might see um, the hind limbs swaying when they walk. They could be wobbly or ataxic. Um, and again, here it's important to identify that your neurological exam should be normal if your signs are attributed to hip dysplasia. Uh, dogs may walk with, a, walk with an arch back. They could have a narrow or a wide based stance to compensate for hip pain. And often they display this bunny hopping behavior when they're taking stairs. So it just stops them from having to extend their hips. Um, coming on to your orthopedic exam. So an orthopedic exam involves for me sort of three stages. So gait analysis, which is the first one I spoke about. Then we can come on to palpation. So um, I start by just basically palpating the forelimbs and the hind limbs of the animal to identify any um, asymmetry, any muscle atrophy that we can see. Um, and then coming on to examining individual joints. So individual joints need to be examined for any swelling, so joint effusions, um, any pain on palpation, pain on range of motion, and actually assessing the degree of range of motion and comparing that to either the normal leg or comparing that to what needs what's normal in a normal dog. So that comes with you know having um, performing the orthopedic exam repeatedly on several dogs. Um, so a thorough orthopedic exam is absolutely essential when it comes to hip dysplasia. So to diagnose a clinical problem of his hip dysplasia, we need to localize the pain to the hips. So these dogs are often painful on their hips, on hip extension especially. And if they have concurrent arthritis, they could have they tend to have a reduction in range of motion of their hips as well. Um, remember, stifle pathology is common and usually occurs in a similar breed, um, a similar breed variation that we see hip dysplasia in as well. Uh, so again, um, do older dogs that present with an acute onset lameness, I think cruciate disease should be higher on your list of differentials. Um, so a thorough orthopedic exam is really essential because these dogs may have underlying hip dysplasia, but that really isn't the clinical problem at the moment. Um, specific tests for hip dysplasia that you can perform on an orthopedic exam are the Barden's hip lift test and the Ortolani test. Both of these really are performed on sedated dogs. So when you sedate them for further diagnostics like x-rays, I'll come on to that a bit later. These are tests that you can perform as well. Um, I'll explain the Ortolani test in a little bit more detail. Um, so this is really how patients should be positioned to begin with. Um, you can have you have the patients in dorsal recumbency and you need an assistant to steady the front end of the patient. Um, and you start off by uh, positioning the femurs perpendicular to the ground, like in the picture, um, and applying downward pressure on the sh shaft of the femur to try to dorsally subluxate the hips. So this hopefully just gives that in a little bit more detail. You're pushing down on the femur to subluxate the hip dorsally. Um, and then once you've done that, you need to abduct the hip so that you um, force the hip back into the acetabulum. And this angle that creates is called the angle of reduction. Um, and once you've done that, again, you slightly, you, you adduct the hip as the arrow shows in third picture until the hip subluxates again, and that's the angle of subluxation. The angles per se are not really important at the moment. And, um, and I'll explain that they come, they might come in handy a bit later on. But the presence of an autolani sign is what you're looking for. And that is that really indicates the presence of hip laxity. It's important to remember that these tests are useful early on to, de uh, to demonstrate any laxity of the hip. Um, but as osteoarthritis progresses, these tests become less useful because as you get remodeling of the joint and filling of the acetabulum, this initial subluxation is not very palpable. So you might end up with a negative autolani sign in the presence of severe hip dysplasia and arthritis. Um, coming on to diagnostic imaging, so the hip extended radiographs are going to form your basis, your um, basically the standard of diagnosis here at the moment, um, and this is really practicing and learning how to do a proper um, hip extended radiograph is going to be essential. So image A shows a well-positioned extended BD radiograph, which should be the standard that you're aiming for. If you look at image B, the pelvis is still straight, but the main difference that hopefully should be clear is that in image A, your femurs are straight and parallel to each other. Whereas in image B, the femurs are slightly abducted um, and therefore the acetabulum, the femoral head is not gonna sit properly within your acetabulum and it will not allow you to, um, to really make the necessary, uh, the necessary diagnostics, the diagnosis you need. So um, taking a proper extended hip radiograph is really important. And this is the radiograph that forms the basis of many of the um, orthopedic scoring schemes that we know of in um, both Britain and Europe. Um, 
So really, in order to be able to do this, heavy sedation or anesthesia is absolutely essential. So there's no way you can get a dog, you can you would be able to position a dog like this that isn't sedated or anesthetized. And that's something to really to really keep in mind. Um, so one of the things that we can evaluate on an x-ray is the presence of arthritis. So these three pictures show a progression of osteoarthritis. Um, picture A shows some very subtle signs. So the arrows are pointing to the dorsal acetabular rim. Um, and you can see that there's some increase in sclerosis of the dorsal acetabular rim. Again, you need to probably get used to looking at a lot of x-rays to be able to pick up these sort of early subtle signs. Um, picture B shows some remodeling of the femoral head, the femoral neck area. So you can see there isn't a pronounced dip between the femoral head and the greater trochanter, like you see in picture A. So this is some osteophytosis of the femoral neck. Um, and picture C shows marked remodeling of the joint. So you can see um, lots of osteophytes around the femoral neck. You can see osteophytosis of the um, acetabular rim, and you can also see quite marked flattening of the femoral head. So all of these signs actually show um, more advanced stages of osteoarthritis. And recently there's been some work done into trying to identify earlier signs, um, radiographic signs of um, very early osteoarthritis. These signs are yet not part of any of the HIP scoring systems. And they can be quite subtle and require quite high quality radiographs to be able to see these. Um, so line A from left to right uh, looks at the caudal, sorry, the circum circumferential femoral head osteophyte. Um, and working from left to right is an increase in severity. Um, and on line B, we have the caudal curvilinear osteophyte or the Morgan line, again, increasing severity from B, uh, from left to right. Sorry, so this picture just looks at what's called the puppy line. This is a normal radiographic sign that can be, can be seen in puppies of up to 18 months in age and shouldn't be mistaken for the Morgan line. Uh, and it's basically, it's a bit more diffuse than what you would see uh, um, for a Morgan line and it has no clinical significance. Um, the other thing that we can do on x-rays, in addition to looking for arthritis, is to assess for joint, joint laxity. And on an extended VD hip radiograph, there's two methods that we can use to assess for joint laxity. Um, the first one is the Norberg angle. Uh, so th this is a way of, uh, of actually quantifying the degree of subluxation. And this is the angle that forms between the line connecting the centers of the femoral heads and the line connecting each femoral head to the lateral tip of the cranial acetabular rim. So that's just shown in picture A here. So the larger the angle, the deeper the acetabulum and increase in concurrency. And a Norberg angle of greater than 105 degrees is considered normal. And again, hopefully this, these x-rays highlight the importance of proper positioning. Like you can't assess a Norberg angle or actually you can't even assess the degree of femoral head coverage by the acetabulum if you haven't got your femurs nicely straight and parallel to each other. Um, the second thing that we can do to assess for joint laxity is very simply to look at the percentage coverage of the femoral head by the acetabulum, as you can see in picture B. It's really important to remember that false negatives are possible. So when you extend the hips for these radiographs, you can mask subluxation by tightening the joint capsule and forcing the femoral head into the acetabulum. And that sort of forms the basis for um, distraction radiography, which is a tool used a lot in the States. Um, this is used to sort of better estimate the degree of passive laxity and things like the distraction index, which will form the pen hip scoring system um, developed by the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and this is, has been found to be a significant predictor for the development of osteoarthritis, um, and it can be assessed in animals as young as the age of 16. It requires a special distraction tool to obtain these three views. So you have a standard extended DV, like we did for the normal, uh, normal x-rays, uh, a compression view, and a distraction view. These techniques are not very commonly used across Europe, but are used very commonly in the US. Um, and it's something to sort of keep in mind for probably later on, and maybe something that we can look into. Um, so just to summarize the initial diagnostic section, so radiographs are really best at assessing signs of secondary arthritis. We can use them to um, assess for some degree of laxity, but it's important to remember that false negatives are possible. Um, and really, for me, the one take home message is that the radiographic signs have no correlation to the clinical picture. So that means that um, you might see a dog with really bad signs of arthritis or actually signs of hip laxity on x-rays, but they might be coping pretty well clinically and there is no correlation between the two. Um, it's really important to assess for other orthopedic conditions and therefore a thorough um, orthopedic exam is vital. 
And remember throughout this talk, as we go on, uh, your clinical picture and not your x-rays or not your radiographic signs uh, uh, is what's going to lead your decision making. Um, so coming on to conservative man management, um, just, uh, just some key points to highlight that this is always the first step in management. Remember that immature dogs that present with signs of hip laxity and lameness can have spontaneous improvement once they reach maturity. A multimodal treatment approach is really important. The mainstay of the management of, uh, of um, the medical management of hip dysplasia is really the management of osteoarthritis, and therefore non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are going to be a mainstay. Um, and really, for all of this, client education is the key because it's a very dynamic process that involves both input from the veterinarian and the client, and something that needs to be adapted as you progress and as the animal progresses as well. So what really are our goals of conservative therapy? We want to alleviate pain and discomfort. We want to maintain function and range of motion of the hip. And we want to be able to regain normal activity and therefore, thereby restore quality of life of our patients. How do we go about doing this? Um, weight and body condition score is important. Pain control is important. Strengthening periarticular muscles, limiting excessive joint stress, and, um, go and um, exercises to maintain improved joint range of motion, maintaining and improving cartilage health, and, improve and limiting inflammation. Um, so a sort of overview of the process, we we'll have an acute phase where animals present that are lame or painful. And at this stage, our goals are going to be strict rest, um, to basically going to be to address the pain and reduce inflammation. And how we would do this is by strict rest, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, drugs, additional analgesics, and a basic introduction to physical therapy. Um, a general health screen and a thorough assessment of your patient is really important before beginning any of this. And again, this is where uh, your orthopedic exam, gait analysis, um, localizing pain to the hips, and a proper radiographic e evaluation are going to be important. Um, and in the long term, things like dietary activity and lifestyle changes are going to form the mainstay of conservative management. Again, remembering that the clinical picture leads to decision making and always remembering to treat the patient and not the radiographic signs that we are seeing. Um, so just to kind of divide this talk up, I'm going to talk I'm going to structure this in basically using a traffic light system. So anything that's highlighted in green suggests that we have sufficient evidence to support the use of this drug or treatment modality in the management of osteoarthritis. And therefore we should start by using anything that's highlighted in green. Um, amber means that we don't have conclusive evidence yet. There may be some theoretical benefit. And again, we can use these treatments or we can consider these treatments based on the individual patient, especially where anything that's highlighted in green has failed or is not possible to do. And finally, anything highlighted in red suggests that there is sufficient evidence to um, suggest that this drug or treatment modality is ineffective or detrimental and therefore should not be used. Um, so starting off with analgesic drugs, as I said, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are going to be a mainstay. Um, this is really for not only the management of pain, but also the management of inflammation associated with osteoarthritis. Um, worldwide, a variety of non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are licensed and are used. I would say uh, meloxicam probably has the most evidence for its use, but the mechanism of action of all these drugs are very similar. Um, maybe we need to start thinking about uh, COX-2 specific inhibitors because these have COX-1 sparing effects and might be associated with less GI side effects. Um, but again, there's a lot of individual variation with dogs and certain dogs that can tolerate certain drugs um, won't tolerate others. So just because a dog doesn't tolerate one uh, non-steroidal doesn't mean it won't tolerate another one. Um, so again, remembering individual patient variation. And again, the duration of the course is really important. And again, this is where client co communication comes into play. Um, I find that a lot of clients will just stop giving the drug once they feel the animal's not pain and not in pain or not lame. Um, and again, it's quite difficult for sometimes for clients to understand that a dog that is lame is most likely lame because he's painful. Um, and if the dog is otherwise bright, a lot of people don't perceive that sense of pain. So client communication and education becomes very, very important. Um, a minimum four week course is essential to sort of reduce inflammation and reduce the upregulation of pain receptors within the joint. Um, so it's not really sufficient to just give a dose when the dog is perceived to be painful. Um, it's really important to think about accurate dosing. Um, 
again, we have we work with small patients. It's important to think of your drugs in a milligram per kilogram dose. These are safe drugs, but some of them do have a narrow therapeutic window. Um, and again, take care with if you're using large animal preparations, the concentrations can vary. And again, thinking about it in milligrams per kilo becomes very, very important. Um, side effects are overall rare, but they can occur. Uh, GI ulceration and renal toxicity are the main things that we talk about. Um, and some, some things to just can take into mind when you're prescribing these drugs is to be careful in older animals to perform a renal and liver panel prior to prescribing these. Um, they should always be administered with food. They're contraindicated if there's any vomiting or diarrhea, and it should be really clearly stated to clients that if the dogs start vomiting or start having diarrhea while on these drugs, they need to be stopped. Um, they should never be administered concurrently with steroids. Um, and if you have administered steroids, at least a two day washout period is recommended before starting these drugs. Um, coming on to the next analgesic drug, which is amantadine. Uh, again, this is an NMDA receptor antagonist. Uh, and NMDA receptors are known to be upregulated in dogs that have chronic pain. Um, they've also been proven to be effective as an adjunct to use with non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and therefore they should be included in the long-term management of OA pain. They can be used to reduce NSA requirement or dependency, and usually we start these dogs off at a dose of five milligram per kilo once a day. Uh, coming on to the next drug, which is gabapentin. This is a GABA analog and is used to treat chronic or neuropathic pain. It has been used in conjunction with non steroidal drugs, but the convinc but convincing evidence for its use in studies are lacking. Um, it doesn't mean that dogs won't respond to it, and actually certain dogs do really well on this drug. So again, it's a useful drug to try if you're failing to control pain with non steroidals and or amantadine. Um, it's important to remember that there's quite a wide dose range, um, and these drugs can take up to two weeks to reach therapeutic levels. Um, they can have side effects like sedation and ataxia. Again, my experience is that these, um, these drugs after use, after they're used for a couple of days, the sedation and ataxia tends, tends to wear off. Um, and again, you can always start at a lower dose and build up as needed. Uh, coming on to paracetamol. Again, the mechanism of action of paracetamol in animals is poorly understood. Um, combination with an opioid like codeine may be effective at treating moderate pain. Again, we don't have convincing studies, but something that definitely can be tried in conjunction with all the other drugs if we need additional pain relief. Um, coming on to tramadol, and um, this is a drug that was used quite commonly in um, Sri Lanka as well. And again, it's something that we've suspected for a long time that uh, wasn't metabolized the same way in dogs and therefore didn't really have any analgesic effects in dogs. Um, and this study that was now published a couple of years ago really proves that point. So this was a double blinded placebo controlled study with objective outcome analysis that actually showed that um, tramadol was completely ineffective in treating pain or joint dysfunction associated with osteoarthritis in, arthritis in dogs, and really it doesn't have a place, uh, it no longer has a place in the management of arthritis. Um, what about the use of corticosteroids? So corticosteroids do have some anti-inflammatory, do have anti-inflammatory properties and therefore might provide some initial pain relief, um, but its long-term effects on cartilage health are uncertain. Um, and really, we have much more safer and much more effective options for reducing joint inflammation. So non-steroidals will provide much better and much um, longer lasting pain relief without the additional side effects or the side effects on joint cartilage as well. Um, it's important to remember that you can't use non-steroidals in conjunction with steroids. And therefore, again, you're taking away probably what is going to be the most effective drug in controlling arthritis related pain. Um, we know that long-term oral therapy has significant side effects. Um, in short, articular corticosteroid injections are used and have been used in certain cases. Um, Long-acting preparations such as triamcinolone have been trialed. We need to be careful as to the technique that we're using to um, do these intraarticular injections. So thinking about um, the risk of joint sepsis and also the effects on cartilage are yet not known. They could be considered in end-stage joints um, where you know surgical management isn't an option and these dogs may be non-responsive to all the other therapies but again something that I wouldn't consider as um, a mainstay or something that we should be thinking of initially in the management of arthritis. 
Um, coming on to nutraceuticals, again, these are very popular and I've sort of tried to divide them into what we have the most evidence for and what we really don't have any evidence for. Um, so omega-3 fatty acids have significant anti-inflammatory pro properties. They've been known to reduce joint inflammation by reducing arachidonic acid production and it affects the same pathway as uh, non-steroidals do. Um, a positive effect of these drugs have been demonstrated in a systematic review. These can be added to food, um, and it's important to sort of think about correct concentrations and dosing for dogs, as it, quite, it can be quite different to um, what we use in people. Um, so the next few, so we've got pentasan polysulfate, which is cartrophen, polysulfated glycosamine glycan, adequan, glucosamine chondritin, and then a variety of other supplements like green lip muscle, elk velvet, antler extract, and turmeric, and more and more of these are added to the market every day. Um, all of these, we don't really have convincing evidence to suggest that they work, but they might be helpful in some dogs. And I guess the take home for me really is that none of these are harmful. So if owners want to try these, there's no harm. But again, before they add green lip muscle extract or turmeric to a dog's diet, I would definitely be recommending them to add the omega-3 fatty acids as a first line, and then they can add whatever the other things they want to do as well. All right, so coming on to probably the most important part of conservative management, and to me, the thing that is probably going to have the most impact on a dog's quality of life, um, which is weight loss. So we know that excessive body weight causes an additional mechanical stress on joints. Um, overweight adult dogs with clinical signs of osteoarthritis have actually been shown to improve significantly after just weight loss alone. Um, we should be aiming for these dogs to have a lean body weight, so body condition score of four to five. I often tell owners that we want these dogs to be on the thinner side of normal. And again, this is where client education really becomes key. Sometimes it's actually really hard to convince owners that their dogs are even overweight to start with. Um, more than that, another thing that I find is that owners will have their dogs on weight loss diet. Um, they feed them what it says on the back of the pack and the dog is still not losing weight. So here it's really important to educate clients that the, the number given on the back of the pack is very much just an average. They need to have targeted calorie restriction so they can trial a weight loss diet. If it's not working, they need to cut down, their, cut down the diet even more. So things like weight loss clinics coming in to be checked by nurses, coming in regularly to the vets to be weighed, um, having that interaction with the practice is really, really important to keep encouraging clients to persist with weight loss. Um, so again, weight loss diets have to be tailored to the individual patient. Owners need to understand that any treats will add on to these calories that they're already giving the patient and need to be controlled as well. Um, what about excessive, uh, sorry, exercise modi modification? Um, again, the goal of this is to limit excessive stress on already unhealthy joints. Um, consistent moderate activity is essential for healthy joints as well. So we want regular controlled low impact activities like leash walking or swimming. Um, when patients have had an acute flare up and are painful, we want to aim for a gradual introduction to controlled exercise. So in this acute inflammatory phase, we want to restrict activity for a couple of weeks. Um, and what does this mean? This means that we are really looking to confine our patients to a small room or sometimes a large crate, depending depending on the size of the dog. Um, and they need to be in this room or crate when they're not on their lead box and they have to be limited to climb. They shouldn't be really climbing stairs or doing any form of high impact activity. Um, again, physical rehabilitation is really important. Um, again, we can think of these in two phases. The early phase where we're looking to reduce inflammation and control pain. And in the long term, where we're looking to maintain joint range of motion and maintain pelvic limb muscle mass. Um, this is just a little sample plan. Um, and as you can see, you're increasing your weight bearing exercises and your therapeutic exercises as the lameness score progressively improves. Um, in the early phase, we're just looking at pain relief, um, passive range of motion exercises, heat and cold therapy. And in the long term, we're introducing therapeutic exercise like balancing, obstacles, hills, stairs, or swimming. Um, Again, little things that can make quite a big difference to these dogs' quality of life. Um, as they grow older and as, um, as the hip dysplasia worsens, they can lose proprioceptive function. So non-slip clothes, rugs to help them navigate is important, supportive beds to sleep on, ramps to help them with stairs and get in and out of vehicles, um, and walking and doing exercise on non-concussive surfaces. So going for a walk in a park rather than walking on, this, uh, on the pavements. 
Um, finally, a little bit about regenerative medicine. Um, again, it's important to realize that this is very much still work in pro progress. There's a lot of ongoing research. Um, the two main areas would be mesenchymal stem cells that are harvested from patients' own fat, usually. They are thought to reduce inflammation associated with arthritis, um, but their effects are short term. The stem cells aren't known to engraft into the cartilage defects. Um, platelet rich plasma is another area of research. Um, these are thought to be a reservoir for growth, cell, growth factors and they recruit stem cells as well. But a major limitation is the discrepancy between donor and collection systems. So the method of harvest is going to influence a number of platelets you have in a sample. We can't really um, assess each individual sample to identify how many platelets we're injecting into a joint and the ideal dose is not known either. We also don't, have, we still have limited evidence. We don't have proper case control studies with objective outcome analysis actually telling us that this treatment strategy works. Um, so really, again, we also need to think about what the potential side effects of these treatments are. And that's mainly going to come down to your injection technique. So uh, maintaining asepsis while doing intraarticular injections is critical to not introducing infection and introducing problems to these joints already. Um, so really, it's something that can be considered when your other treatment options may have failed, um, but it's not something that's really considered routine as of yet. Um, so in summary, the goals of conservative management are to alleviate pain, improve joint range of motion and build muscle mass. It's important to remember that the progression of arthritis will still occur, so we need to be continuously reassessing these patients and picking up when conservative management isn't working. Um, overall, with non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the clinical benefits outweigh the risk um, of adverse side effects. And again, a reduction in body weight is one of the most important components. Um, so coming on to the final part of my talk, which is surgical options. Um, starting off with a few key points again, um, more than two thirds of these dogs are actually successfully managed surgically and don't really need any um, surgical intervention in their lifetime. Uh, again, remembering that there is no radiographic evidence, um, uh, that, sorry, there's no correlation between radiographic changes of laxity or osteoarthritis and the clinical picture. So we can't just look at an x-ray or a radiograph and say whether a dog needs surgery or not. Um, the surgical options that we have available are really salvage procedures. Um, we should be very cautious when considering surgery in a ju juvenile dog, because as I mentioned, many of these cases will improve as they mature. We need to make sure we've done a thorough evaluation for other orthopedic or neurological conditions and make sure we're not missing things like uh, concurrent cruciate disease or cruciate rupture. Um, and remembering again that our clinical picture is what leads to decision making. And again, treating the patient and not the radiograph. Um, before I move on to specific surgical techniques, I just wanted to take a brief moment to consider some general considerations that we should keep in mind when thinking about orthopedic surgery. And this is really not just for surgery to do with hip dysplasia, but um, general comments for any orthopedic surgery. It's important to remember that orthopedic surgeries involve deep tissue cavities. We are often leaving in implants. So infection is not only clinically very serious, but it's actually, it can be catastrophic for the surgical procedure that you've just performed. So we need to think a little bit more about the facilities that we have um, and whether you know, the practice that you're working at is really suitable to be performing orthopedic surgery in. Um, we really should have a dedicated theater space, ideally one that is dedicated to clean surgeries, but at least um, a theater space that is dedicated to surgery alone, an easily cleanable room. We need to think about disinfection, how we're performing these. Uh, we need to think about the personnel. So um, do we, are our surgeons wearing appropriate theater gowns? Are we using appropriate sterile gloves, aseptic technique when scrubbing in, um, aseptic preparation of your surgical site? Uh, your instrumentation, are they properly sterilized? Are we using an autoclave at the correct temperature, et cetera? Um, what sort of anesthetic drugs do we have? Again, I would think that these, are, these uh, orthopedic surgeries tend to be quite long procedures. Um, a lot of injectable drugs will accumulate in tissues and end up, you will end up with a quite a rough recovery and an unpredictable recovery in patients. So gas anesthesia is really ideal, um, especially for long surgical procedures. Um, again, are we moni appropriately monitoring our anesthetics? Again, long procedures, we need to have the surgeon concentrating on what they're doing. So do we have someone who can effectively monitor our anesthetic? 
Um, what pain relief do we have? Again, they're long procedures, they involve bones, they can be, they're very painful. So do we have access to opioid analgesia? What sort of post-operative analgesia are we going to use? And those are things that we should be asking ourselves before the surgery is performed. Um, and finally, access to in-house radiography. So again, any um, orthopedic surgery requires post-op radiographs that need to be taken immediately after the procedure, allowing us a chance to go back into theater if anything is wrong. So really we have to have access to um, x-rays in-house. Um, so I would consider most orthopedic surgeries and certainly the ones to do with hip dysplasia are definitely non-emergency surgeries. And I would strongly recommend considering referral if these facilities are not available um, at it. I'm, I would suggest that that, is, that would really be best for your patients. Um, so coming on to the first surgical procedure that I'm gonna talk about, which is a femoral head and neck excision. Um, this is a really effective treatment option. It requires, doesn't require much specialist equipment and it does really provide immediate pain relief for animals with co coxofemoral arthritis. Um, there are several indications for this procedure. So chronic or recurrent coxofemoral luxation, severe coxofemoral osteoarthritis, like secondary to hip dysplasia, comminuted femoral head, neck, or acetabular fractures, avascular necrosis of the femoral head, and finally a failed total hip replacement. Um, it can really be performed in a patient of any size, but we know that smaller patients tend to have more predictable outcomes. Um, again, when we're selecting cases for these procedures, remember that it is a salvage procedure and it should really be considered for animals that are non-responsive to medical management, which means that you've tried a convincing period of conservative management, the animal has failed this and remains painful, and therefore we're going on to our second step. Um, again, think about immature animals with lameness due to hip dysplasia, the majority of them will improve, so it's something that really shouldn't be considered prior to a patient reaching skeletal maturity. Really important to rule out other orthopedic disease or neurological disease like cruciate ligament ruptures or lumbosacral disease. Um, so the next few slides are just gonna highlight a few key points in this procedure. Um, the procedure is described really well in the majority of textbooks. And if you're considering performing this, I'd encourage you to have to read up on this first, um, but hopefully this just highlights some interesting points. Um, so the first step is, uh, patient positioning. We usually uh, position these patients in lateral recumbency with the affected leg uppermost. A hanging limb, uh, limb preparation is essential because you need to be able to manipulate the limb um, sterilely under anesthesia to be able to effectively perform the procedure. Uh, the approach is a craniodorsal approach to the hip via a craniolateral skin incision. Again, the approach is described in most surgical textbooks um, and it's a fairly straightforward um, approach to follow. Um, for me, there are some key steps I'd consider uh, important in the procedure. The first one being luxation of the hip by transection of the ligament of the femoral head. Um, sometimes it's difficult to actually tell whether you've completely luxated it or not. And the, the easiest way to know that you have is the fact that when you externally rotate the limb, you can see most of the femoral head and the femoral neck. It's really important before performing the osteotomy to completely externally rotate the limb. So your patella points to the ceiling. Um, assist, you have to have an assistant who will hold the limb in this position for you while you perform the osteotomy. It's really important to expose the femoral neck properly, and you do this by elevating the vastus lateralis muscle, which inserts here. Um, the osteotomy should be performed using an oscillating saw. You could use an osteotome, but it tends to give you a less uniform cut, and it does um, carry the risk of femoral, um, femoral fractures um, if the osteotome is not properly positioned. Um, your landmarks for the cut are the lateral extent of the trochanteric fossa and the lesser trochanter, which is on the medial side of the femur. Um, after doing your osteotomy, it's really important to inspect the cut surface of the osteotomy, and you can do this by further externally rotating the limb. And again, post-operative radiographs are essential to assess the osteotomy, and I'll come on to that in a little bit. So this is just a, a bone model that shows you where you're making your cut. Um, and you can see at the distal end of the cut, the little bony prominence that you can see here is a lesser trochanter. Um, so post-operative radiographs, what are we looking at? We're really looking for two things. We're looking for um, smoothness of our cut. Uh, it's possible to leave spurs on the caudal cortex. So you can see in A, we've, the, the cut is really nice, straight and smooth. And actually in this cut, the lesser trochanter has been left intact. Um, and then if you look at x-ray B, you can see that there's quite a lot of femoral neck still, uh, still in place. Um, that's a really, that's not a very sufficient cut. And leaving um, so much of the femoral neck can cause impediment of um, hip extension and therefore pain. So this, 
So this is um, the same, same patient that's basically been taken back into theater to complete the cut. Um, and that really just highlights how important it is to be able to have in-house x-rays to be able to look at that and go back into theater if you need to. Um, so physical rehabilitation is really important. Um, it basically is as important as the surgery you perform. And this is a discussion I have with owners prior to undertaking to perform any of this surgery, because if owners aren't willing to put in the work in this stage, there really isn't any point in performing the surgery. Um, unlike a lot of these, a lot of the orthopedic procedures we perform, restricted activity and cage rest are contraindicated. Um, if the limb, if uh, the limb isn't used early enough, you can get fibrous tissue formation that impedes joint range of motion. So early limb use is really critical to the success of the procedure. Usually, we start passive range of motion exercises immediately after surgery, um, and look, we look to start active exercises about two weeks later. Um, so again, this should highlight really the importance of proper pain management prior to surgery or sorry, straight after surgery, because if animals are not comfortable, they're really not going to use the limb. You're not going to be able to do any passive range of motion or encourage them to do any exercise. Um, and therefore, the surgery is really not going to be successful. So appropriate analgesia is absolutely critical. Um, just as a side note, um, preoperative physiotherapy is actually encouraging patients with poor muscle mass or tone as they subjectively tend to have a better outcome if you've worked on this prior to surgery as well. Um, so what do we know about the outcome? Um, we know that better outcomes are reported in patients that are under 20 kilos. But really, it's important to remember that any patient with debilitating osteoarthritis that has undergone a correctly performed femoral head and neck excision will have improved limb function and quality of life. You can have a mechanical gait abnormality due to artificial limb shortening, but usually these patients are perfectly comfortable, but it's something to sort of warn the owners about. As I mentioned before, aggressive pain relief and physical rehabilitation is absolutely critical to the success of the procedure. Um, and again, something to discuss with owners is that return to maximal function can sometimes take months. Um, just a slide to mention other surgical options that are considered available, um, out, probably outside of Sri Lanka at this stage, um, for the treatment of hip dysplasia. And the first one is juvenile pelvic symphysiasis. Um, this is where you apply heat necrosis using cautery, usually at the pubic symphysis, to cause closure of the pubic symphysis. Um, this sort of changes the growth of the pelvis to result in um, increasing femoral head coverage. This is performed in patients between 12 to 20 weeks of age with diagnosed hip laxity. It does have a fairly low risk of complications, but case selection is very challenging. There's a very small time window in which you can perform this surgery. Um, so distraction index or the degree of sublax uh, subluxation has been correlated with osteoarthritis. But as I mentioned, the degree of osteoarthritis is not associated with clinical outcome. So for me, really, the challenge in these cases is that we might be performing a surgery that is unnecessary and in performing it in patients that may go on to live the rest of their life never needing surgery for hip dysplasia. Um, the next one is a triple or double pelvic osteotomy. This is where we make um, cuts in the pelvic bones to externally rotate uh, the acetabulum again uh, with the goal of increasing femoral head coverage. This again needs to be done in patients with no clinical, uh, with no radiographic signs of osteoarthritis and only demonstrating signs of laxity. And usually this is considered for patients less than a year of age. For me, same complications as you would think about with a JPS, um, but also these surgeries have a higher risk uh, compared to JPS. Case selection is really challenging and we might be over-treating a, a population of dogs. Um, a total hip replacement is considered gold standard as it restores normal conformation of the hip joint. However, it's a highly technical procedure that requires specialist surgical skill, specialist facilities and equipment. Um, it can also be catastrophic um, if it goes wrong. So uh, again, it's not um, something that we should be considering in Sri Lanka as of yet. Um, the other two procedures, so uh, hip denervation or a pec pectineous myectomy um, are procedures that used to be performed. Um, they usually Again, procedures, palliative procedures that address pain associated with hip, dis, uh, hip arthritis. Um, they've largely fallen out of favor and probably um, have been replaced by femoral head and neck excision. Um, just to mention some surgical procedures that are really contraindicated in patients with abnormal hip joint conformation, so hip dysplasia. Uh, so close reduction of luxated hip. So in a patient that has normal hip joint conformation and a traumatic luxation, um, often the ligament of the femoral head is broken, is um, has ruptured, and you might have a tear in the joint capsule that allows luxation of the hip. 
So when we close or reduce the hip, we still have most of the primary stabilizers of the hip intact. So um, the dorsal acetabular rim is intact and has a normal conformation. And if it's only a small tear in the joint capsule, it will heal quickly. That, and that's what really results in stability and allows for that close reduction to stay in and work. Um, however, if you're performing, it is possible for patients with hip dysplasia to have a traumatic luxation. Um, however, if you close or reduce this hip, it's not going to really stay in place because the normal stabilizer is most importantly that cranial acetabular rim, and the acetabulum is too shallow to hold that hip in place. Um, and then hip toggle placement. So again, this is a really useful technique in a patient with normal hip joint conformation that has a traumatic luxation that maybe reluxates after close reduction. Uh, but again, the hip toggle is really just replacing the ligament of the femoral head. Um, in a patient that has hip dysplasia, the conformation of the hip joint is not normal, the acetabulum is too shallow, and you don't have a good cranial acetabular rim, uh, sorry, a dorsal acetabular rim to stabilize the hip. In most cases, the joint capsule is really stretched as well. So again, this is a procedure that isn't going to hold the hip in place um, and should really not be performed in patients with hip dysplasia. Um, so it just really highlights the importance of proper radiographic assessment for signs of incongruity and hip, display, hip osteoarthritis is essential before you can consider what surgical procedures to perform. And so really, in summary, um, we need to think about our management of young large breed puppies. Again, this is um, an area which vets have a large role to play. Um, we need to be advising clients appropriately on nutrition, nutritional management. And this is something that really can have a very big impact on the development of hip dysplasia. We need to think about breeding these animals. Um, hip dysplasia has a strong hereditary component. And really, as vets, we should be advising these clients not to breed from any animals that have signs of hip dysplasia. Um, we need to remember that over two thirds of these dogs can be managed successfully um, using medical management. And when we're considering ma medical management, we uh, need to keep in mind this traffic light system that I spoke about. So starting with things that we have very good evidence for um, and also making sure that our client education and client management is appropriate. Um, we need to think about basic principles before we consider um, performing orthopedic surgery in these patients. And then finally, the femoral head and neck excision is really a good, a good procedure to be considering in Sri Lankan conditions. Um, we've had very good outcomes um, reported with, these, with, with this procedure. It provides very good pain relief for these, for these patients, but it is a salvage procedure and appropriate case selection is really essential. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, okay, so I, I can see you've got two questions already. So um, Senora says, do you have any experience with lo using low-dose ketamine? Um, personally, no. Um, I've used it a lot as post, um, either intraoperative or postoperative analgesia, but not in the long-term management of arthritis. Um, again, looking at its mechanism of action on the NMDA receptors, I would assume that it does, it would provide some good pain relief. Again, I'm not really sure about the practicalities of using injectable ketamine long term. Um, and again, I would say if you don't have access to amantadine, maybe that's something to consider. And patients that are not responding to standard pain relief, I would say, yep, it's something that could be considered. Um, and then, yes, Librella injections, that's a very new um, a new product that's just been introduced in the UK, to my knowledge, in the last sort of two to three months. Again, personally, I don't, I haven't used it very much. Um, I think I've used it in one case uh, at the RVC just before I left. Um, and again, I think it's something that has quite strong evidence for its use and should be, if available, something that can be considered. Um, I used it in a case that wasn't very responsive to a combination of non steroidals amantadine and gabapentin. Um, I didn't follow up the case long enough to see how it worked. Uh, but I think, again, it's something that we have good evidence for. Yeah. Dr. Mahika, uh, just, uh, just to uh, uh, barge in very sorry, I'll, I'll just read the questions. Uh, so once again, everyone knows what the questions were. Yeah, so sorry. <laughs> that'll be better, I, I feel. So the first question was, uh, do you have any uh, experience with using low dose kit? I mean, that was from Dr. Se uh, Senra. I think Dr. Mahika answered that question as well. And the second was uh, from Dr. Dani, uh, whether the, the, uh, the she has used liberal injection for osteoarthritis. And finally, Question was, uh, when you recommend commercial diets uh, in diagnosed hip dysplasia in young dogs, would you recommend puppy, large breed dog or adult dog diet? So, um, yeah. 
yeah, so I would, for any dog that is less than the age of less than two years, um, who's considered skeletally immature, I would use a puppy large breed diet uh, because again, calcium phosphorus requirements and calcium phosphorus ratios are different in young growing dogs versus large breed dogs. Uh, but I think one of the struggles that we have are calorie um, restriction as well, because certain dogs, even at very young ages, can be very overweight. I would still use a puppy diet, um, but I probably would, again, look at individual tearing of tailoring of the quantity you're feeding for each dog and not just go by the quantities that are given on the back of the packet. Okay, that's good. So I think uh, the screen is open for questions. You can just type in any questions you have or just unmute and ask them directly. Dr. Mahika is here with us and uh, thank you Dr. Mahika for that uh, elucidative address. I'm sure they're having uh, quite a lot of questions. So we're just uh, waiting for them to ask a few. Well, until they do, I, I'm just interested now as, as, as you uh, rightly said, that uh, NSAIDs are more or less the ideal uh, drugs of choice when it comes to medical management in terms of pain and, and the inflammatory aspect. Uh, and also, is it, is it possible that uh, we start uh, other painkillers together with uh, meloxicam from day one? From what I, what, I, what I read was that initially you need at least four weeks interval, you know, four weeks period for it to properly have, a, have its effect. Is it possible that we start uh, conjunction therapy from day one? Yeah, definitely. So I think I, um, I couldn't think of it in two ways. So if you have a very young dog that's presenting with hip laxity and um, at that stage, you usually have pain associated with joint inflammation, I would probably just start them on a non-steroidal at this stage. Um, again, what I'm saying now is very much personal preference and training rather than what should what is you know written in stone. So um, for me, if I have a young dog that's just presenting with um, mild signs of joint inflammation and pain associated with hip laxity, I'd probably start them on a non-steroidal. Um, just to clarify, I think non-steroidal start they they start to act very quickly. What I meant by a four week minimum course is that you want to um, keep them on these non-steroidals for four weeks to reduce the inflammation associated with the joint. Um, so I would probably start those dogs on um, st just straightforward uh, non steroidal to begin with. However, if I had a dog present, an older dog presenting with signs of chronic osteoarthritis, um, then my pain management strategy would be a bit different. And I would start with an anti-inflammatory drug as well as amantadine. Um, and in those cases, a lot of the time, my goal is to hopefully try to wean them off non steroidals after a while due to you know, potential side effects and these being older dogs. So um, sometimes that's not possible. And we have older dogs that are on non steroidals for years without any problems. Um, but the goals of pain relief are a little bit different. And also I would assume that a lot older dog with arthritis also has a chronic component in their pain. So a drug like amantadine would be very useful at that stage. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, we also have uh... Dr. Charles with us. Uh, Dr. Charles, any uh, comments, questions? Um, yeah, sure. I do. Can you guys hear me? Can you yes, give me can. a thumbs up if you can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, great. Um, so number one, um, I completed my residency 27 years ago, and um, I continue to treat a moderate amount of hip dysplasia, but my area of expertise is really more into cancer, neurosurgery, things like that. But I'm just amazed at how we could have done um, our residencies is exactly the same time because the information that you provided is just timeless. And I don't think that that much has changed um, in the management of, of hip dysplasia. Um, and I, if there wasn't one point or one factor that you stated that I uh, didn't agree wholeheartedly with. So it was a great presentation and a great review for me. So thanks for that. Um, a couple of comments. The first one is that tramadol, um, you made the comment um, that it's not very effective for osteoarthritis. I think that it's been shown to be fairly ineffective for any pain relief in dogs. And I think that it's really over, overused and, and they see that the dog is sedated and they think that it's providing pain relief, but it's really not providing really any, any pain relief at all. It's just providing sedation. So um, I think that people that think that they're treating pain with tramadol are probably misguided um, in dogs. Um, the next comment or question was, just the use for, uh, for uh, hip dysplasia surgery um, is uh, epidurals and nerve blocks. Um, and is that something that you, uh, is commonly available in Sri Lanka? And is that something that, um, uh, that you like or that you recommend or? Uh, 
Yeah, so maybe some, I'll answer what I know, but maybe someone who's worked more regularly in Sri Lanka will have a better idea. Um, yes, uh, from my training, yes, lots of local nerve blocks and lots of um, epidurals. I, I you know, love to be able to use them. Um, from what I understand here, uh, we do have access to lidocaine, but um, access to any sort of um, medium or long acting uh, local anesthetics is not really readily available. Um, again, morphine, um, preservative free morphine is not available in Sri Lanka. And also um, it's not a common epidurals and local, and local nerve blocks are not very commonly performed or very easily accessible techniques, I think. Yeah, because I, 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 especially in a setting where you don't have 24 hour care, doing yeah. nerve blocks or epidurals is just so great for uh, providing the care when you're not gonna be able to observe the patient for 12 hours or whatever overnight. Um, and then the last question, I guess, or the comment that I'd have is that with toggle pinning with dogs with hip dysplasia, understanding that hip dysplasia is, is um, uh, as you have alluded to, not a black or white situation, but shades of gray. And if you had just very mild degenerative changes, you might consider doing a toggle pin just because the outcome can be so much better than an FHO um, or femoral head and neck ostectomy. And so I've, I have done toggle pins in dogs with very mild hip dysplasia and found them to be effective. Um, but obviously if you have one of those cases, it's just an end stage hip, it's a complete waste of time. Yeah. Um, and then one last question was, was Ben K with you at RVC? It's a very close friend. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So Ben is, uh, Ben is one of our surgeons. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he's, he's amazing. He's a really, really he's lovely guy. One of the nicest people you'd ever meet. Yeah, he's, um, he's helping me study for boards quite a lot at the moment. Yeah, great. Well, hopefully we'll see you down in Melbourne sometime. Yeah, hopefully. Excuse me. Yes, we have another question. I have a small question. Can I ask it now? Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, um, regarding this hip dysplasia, what I do is here, Rather than treating, so I'll give some advice to prevent getting hip dysplasia. Can I hear you? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. 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 What I do is I advise them to have a special cage with a rubber carpet to grow there until you get the strong ligaments. Otherwise, any puppy uh, playing on a tight floor, so slippery floors, they get hip dysplasia. So to prevent that, um, uh, if you have a proper uh, cage or playpen for them to play, so it don't happen. Other thing is in Sri Lanka, um, last uh, I think more than 30 years, uh, I was practicing, uh, I get so many orthopedic cases, not patellar dis uh, dysplasia because um, uh, I, I faced for two cases, those two uh, patellar relaxation is due to short traffic accidents, not due to pathological lesions. So we want to know why, why in Sri Lanka, we won't get, um, like in Australia, they get a lot of uh, patella abnormality or hip abnormality. So I think at the beginning, if you can have a proper management system, we can stop all these uh, uh, patella luxation and the hip dysplasia. That was my. Another thing is post-operative care. Also, what I do is I give a photograph for the cage, to keep them there for at least two months, like hip dysplasia or patella or, or any orthopedic. So then um, uh, they recover very fast. And uh, uh, you mentioned about the um, uh, so the X-ray, you are remove, uh, cutting the uh, femur neck, but same leg, I saw the tibia also have improved shape. Uh, or then if, uh, treatment for the, that um, same leg, um, tibia is a little bit um, not normal. So those are the questions I, I had uh, to ask from you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Kodikar. Thank you very much. Well, um, maybe I can give some comments and then Dr. Kunz can carry on. Um, so I think that, yeah, you mentioned the point about environmental management earlier on, and I think I started off by 
talking about both things like hip dysplasia, patellar luxation, there are what we call um, developmental abnormalities. So the idea is that certain puppies are born with the genetics that will contribute to the development of these diseases, but they are developmental diseases. So it means that there are certain environmental factors that we can um, change or modify that will influence their phenotype or influence the fact. Uh, influence whether they show signs of the disease or not. Yeah, so yes, yeah. certain uh, modifications that we can make to their environment when they're growing um, can certainly impact the development of um, clinical signs. And I think the one that we have the most amount of evidence for is the change in nutrition, which is what I you know, spent some time talking about. Um, and I think we need to be careful about environmental modification because again, um, a, a level of exercise is also really important. So you know, restricting puppies, um, restricting the activity to you know, small areas, to, 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 you know, to a very small area is probably not the best thing either. So it's, it's, it's just, I guess it's about a balance and modifying any of these environmental factors that we think are important. Um, Anything? Sorry, I'm maybe losing track of the questions. Did you I think you mentioned a comment about um, these X rays? Yeah. That's so, the one. Yeah. That's the one. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this this patient, um, these it, it, this is just um, standard. Uh, um, just some pictures of X-rays looking at the femoral head and neck position in particular. Yes, this um, there's, it's, this dog does have a significant tibial growth abnormality, um, and I don't know I don't I don't know about the case. I don't know whether there was any clinical signs associated with that. And again, I think again, all I can say is that again, we are making sure that we treat the patient. So if there is um, any patella luxation associated with this, any pain, type of pain associated with this, the, these abnormalities, then yes, we need to consider treating them. Well, uh, just to add to that, uh, yeah, Dr. Maika, I think uh, uh, Ranjana Madam is asking, is there any way of predicting the development of CHD in a litter of pups, example, like a genetic analysis? Um, so again, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I don't, I, the short answer is no, because it is a polygenic disease. So um, genetic analysis of these dogs have shown certain um, areas of uh, a canine um, canine gene analysis that is associated with the development of hip dysplasia. And there are certain tests that have been developed, but I don't think there's one genetic test that can tell you whether um, puppies are gonna develop hip dysplasia or not. And again, going back to the fact that this is a developmental disease where genetics has a certain influence, but also the environment and factors in the growing and developmental stage can also influence whether these dogs actually develop clinical signs of hip dysplasia or not. Sure, yeah. And I think, uh, uh... I think this is for the pain uh, management uh, aspect. The use of zero uh, zero doll as an in NSA is uh, have, like have you any experience uh, with that? Um, that's like, actually not a pro uh, product I'm familiar with. Doc okay, I don't know, Doctor Kunz, if you've ever heard of it. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I have a question, uh, Doctor Mahik. Actually, it's very good. Actually. You were concerned. You you put on your you know presentation towards more management and clinical care and conservative care rather than doing uh, surgeries. You know we were expecting a very surgical you know presentation <laughs> from you from the beginning. At the at the end, you get a very small you know portion to the surgical attempt. And anyway, it's good. So my question is, uh, Mike, actually, uh, you were talking about this uh, uh, what do you call it? early neutering. So we we believe this is a genetical you know I mean predisposition in this hip anomalies. So how can you contribute, correlate this hip, I mean, uh, early neutering of dogs, uh, I mean, uh, will develop hip dysplasia conditions like, I mean, um, what's again, the, yeah. It's quite a controversial um, topic at the moment, the effect of neutering uh -huh. on hip dysplasia and on a lot of, actually a lot of developmental diseases. But again, coming back to the fact that we don't consider hip dysplasia purely genetic disease, it is a developmental disease. So dogs have to have the genetics to develop hip dysplasia, but they also have to have these environmental factors that are, is going to lead to the development of clinical signs. So um, there, is some, um, there is some suggestion that the lack of exposure to testosterone in the growing phase can lead mm -hmm. to the development of clinical signs associated with hip dysplasia. So it's not based on the largest amount of evidence at the moment from what I know, but it is something that you would consider and something that you would discuss with the owner before discuss, uh, neutering a large breed dog. Again, it is definitely not suggesting that these dogs shouldn't be neutered, but it's uh, it's suggesting that maybe we need to wait till they're skeletally mature before doing that. 
Yeah. And I have another question, Mike. Actually, you talk about this over supplementation of calcium. And uh, I mean, you think due to our supplementation itself can, can cause uh, hip dysplasia or I mean, rather than having some other abnormalities in the bones, like, I mean, what, what is the comment? Uh, yeah. Yes. So over supplement, again, it, over supplementation in a dog that doesn't have the genes for hip dysplasia, probably not going to yeah. do anything, but it can mm. have other side effects, but over supplementing in a dog that is predisposed to have, um, have hip dysplasia, puppies don't really have a mechanism of getting rid of excess calcium and mm. it can certainly affect um, the process of um, osteochondrosis and the process of cartilage to bone formation. So this mm -hmm. can lead to, uh, it, it has been shown to be able to lead to hip display, clinical signs of hip dysplasia. Yeah. And in the present day market, uh, Dr. Mahika, we get a lot of supplements, you know, like uh, having chondrin sulfate and glycosamine and glycans and, you know, uh, if I'm not mentioning the commercial names here, actually, so you, you do you believe in them? And I mean, uh, will they have a contribution uh, to prevent to care of this dysplasia or the dogs having um, this dysplasia at the moment? Any, any, any help? So I mean, um, yeah. yeah. So this is just going back to this slide again. So there's be, there's loads of nutraceuticals all over the world that are um, marketed for arthritis, really. I wouldn't say that any of these have any specific effect on hip dysplasia per se, but we're treating the secondary effects of arthritis here. Um, and again, the only one that we have very convincing evidence that it works is omega-3 fatty acids. Um, the other things like glucosaminic glycans, cartrophen injections, um, chondritin sulfate and all of these other supplements may work. They may have effects in reducing joint inflammation. Um, they may have some effects in um, helping regeneration of cartilage. So they're not really harmful to be given, but they shouldn't form the mainstay. So for example, a patient that is really difficult to tablet, you wouldn't start by giving them chondritin sulfate. You'd want to focus on something that is uh, actually proven to um, have some benefit. Okay, Mahika, thank you very much. Uh, Mahika, I've looked up the, um the Zeradol, and it's um it's a cyclophenac, which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory that um, related to diclofenac, which is apparently uh, apparently quite dangerous for use in dogs uh, with risk of um of gastrointestinal ulceration <laughs> and uh, renal toxicity. And then there's a Zeradol Zeradol SP, which has uh, paracetamol and another um, another component, which is, um, again, it's also supposed to be probably not a great idea to use in dogs. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mike, one, just, uh, one, one question. Hyaluronic acid, is it contraindicated? Uh, is, why is it red here? Is it, is it contraindicated? Uh, yeah, so sorry, I didn't mention that in the talk, but the systematic review that I alluded to to begin with look, that looked at all these nutraceuticals that are um, that are used in hip dysplasia actually showed that there was really no convincing benefit of giving hyaluronic acid. So again, it's something that you can, it doesn't really have many side effects, but um, shouldn't really be considered like part of your mainstay. Yeah, because some of the products in Sri Lanka do have uh, hyaluronic acid together with uh, glycosamine glycan and glucosamine. So yeah, again, I think those are quite, they're human products, aren't they? So, mm -hmm. Probably, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, again, I wouldn't say that it's, you know, you should absolutely shouldn't be giving it, but it's, again, I think it's important when you're giving supplements to sort of think about what's in each of them and what your objectives, yeah. what the objective you're trying to achieve with it is. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mahika. Hello. Yes. Uh, yeah. I have one uh, question. Uh, I, uh, I saw this uh, hip dysplasia most common in Labrador and German Shepherd dogs. Uh, do you have a comment on that, please? Uh, yeah, so those are two of the most common breeds that his dysplasia has been identified in worldwide. And again, we think that has something to do with breeding and genetics. So um, they do have a genetic predisposition to the development of this disease. And it's something that the breed associations are looking into and looking into breed out hip dysplasia in these populations by using hip scoring systems. Um, so again, it's something to you know, we need to be aware of that. And again, as vets, we need to probably be aware of breeding from these dogs and encouraging people not to breed from these dogs to hopefully be able to reduce the prevalence of hip dysplasia in these breeds in Sri Lanka. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
Uh, Dr. Mahika, if you don't mind, another question from me. Now, uh, I saw the uh, heat therapy and cryotherapy. Uh, could you, like, uh, if you don't mind, uh, could you, like, uh, maybe, how are we going to, like, implement this? Are they going simultaneously or is it, is it because, you know, if it's, if, it's, if it's ongoing inflammation, you can't uh, have uh, heat therapy going on. So how, we, how is that going to work? Um, so, again, uh, this is probably... <laughs> Um, a question to someone the, the physical rehabilitation surrounding the, um, arthritis management is a whole different topic completely mm -hmm. on its own um, and it's something that I have had the privilege of being able to refer to a physical yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, but my very basic understanding is that mm -hmm. cold therapy or cryotherapy is very useful in the early inflammatory phases um, and heat therapy is more useful later on Absolutely. to encourage it or to sort of build on your joint range of motion um, and they can be used in combination. So you can start off with heat. Uh, you can start off with um, heat therapy, do your massage, do your exercises, and then do some cold therapy afterwards to hopefully reduce any inflammation that maybe you have created as well. Um, and that's how I look at it. But it's a whole different. Um, it's, re yeah. it's really a completely vast topic. I understand. Thank you. So the floor is open for any more, any other questions. If you have, you can type it in or just. Uh, and Dr. Mahika, can we use hydrotherapy and uh, hydrobath in uh, hydrotherapy as a physiotherapy for the treatment of uh, hip dysplasia? Um, yeah, of course. So hydrotherapy is great. It um, is a low impact form of exercise and it's really been, it, it, it forms a mainstay of physical rehabilitation programs that we would recommend for dogs. Um, but it's important to kind of what we do in Sri Lanka is mostly, I think, just putting animals in a pool or in the sea and getting them to swim on their own, which can be useful. But um, really, uh, there are very targeted hydrotherapy programs that we can use. So underwater treadmill use um, and specific swimming techniques that encourage them to use their hind legs. Um, it's really, really good. It can improve their hind limb muscle mass, joint range of motion, all while um, being very, very low impact. So I, I would say that it's a really good thing to be able to use. Hey, Mahika. Um, Hello. Uh, just a question with regards to doing the FHOs. Um, do you tend to do them staged, one leg after the other, or do you think but doing no. them together has a, uh, has a benefit? It's been a very... I'm just trying to think of... No, I would. I, I think I would do them staged, Senator, just because of what I alluded to again about early limb use being so important. Um, in the majority of cases that I've had to treat bilateral hip dysplasia, um, I've done them staged. But again, if um, if your dog is so painful that you can't stand up on both legs, then maybe you could consider doing bilateral. Um, but like with most orthopedic surgeries, I would consider doing them staged. Thank you. I'll just add a little bit about the whole breeding side of things because I know uh, like I work at a clinic that does work with a little bit of breeding and we do pre-breeding evaluation. And so two things that I do as part of our clinic is number one, um, we do the, the breeding females and the males have to go through um, compulsory um, hip and elbow evaluations. Um, so we, we get them to do that as part of it. And the second thing is they can do, I think it's like a 120 point genetic analysis that out of that, that looks at about 10 um, genes that kind of look at the um, hip dysplasia and elbow issues. So it's mainly focused on your Labrador's golden retrievers and um, greyhounds as well. Um, I know hip dysplasia isn't a big problem there, but it's something that they look here. Um, so I think that's kind of one of those things that Sri Lanka might start looking at as part of their pre-breeding evaluation. Um, the genetic evaluation is quite expensive. They spend about $600 in Sri Lankan terms of about 100,000 rupees. Um, so yeah, that's, that's something for Sri Lankans, I suppose. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. That's actually really interesting and kind of what I, um, what I wasn't very good at getting across. But yeah, so there is a genetic test, but um, as Senator pointed out, it is looking at the presence of 
genes that could be associated with hip dysplasia, but it's, again, in a Sri Lankan perspective, I think it's important to realize that the presence of those genes don't meet, doesn't mean that that individual dog will develop hip dysplasia, but it does mean that we probably shouldn't be breeding from that dog because we're, we're going to be spreading those genes. And yes, I think something that we could all possibly think about as vets here is pre-breeding evaluation in terms of radiographs. Um, and at least dogs that have very overt signs of hip dysplasia and x-rays reading from them, that would Nona. make a difference. Nona. I think uh, Dr. Niranjala has a question. Do you want me to read it out, Chantrinu? Ah, yes, there's a question. Yeah, go ahead. I, I didn't see it. Very sorry. That's okay. Um, so her question is, does curating to remove the nerve endings in and around the affected joint help alleviating pain? Um, so that was the procedure that I mentioned as de innovation. So it was something that used to be done um, for hip dysplasia. But again, it has very unpredictable outcomes, and I think has largely been replaced by um, femoral head and neck excisions. So Yes, it was suggested to be helpful, but the outcomes are very unpredictable and it's not something that I would consider doing in when we have an option such as a femoral head and neck excision. Sorry, I'm just barging in and adding something else as well. Just for Sri Lankan point of view, um, you can, if you ever want to get an oscillating saw, there is a cheap way of doing it, is to invest in one of those Makita um, saws that does have the oscillating functions. You can easily buy the attachment um, online, and I'm happy to send links to whoever needs it. I think it's about 300, 400 Australian dollars. Um, I know a lot of the practices, even my practice before I started um, doing more of the orthopedic procedures, we kind of use this cheap of a jig as I would call it. Um, so that's that's always an option as well for Sri Lankan vets who are thinking of um, doing more um, FHOs, etc. Yeah, that's a good point. That, that's what um, I've used at PetVet here and worked really well. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Um, uh, excuse me. Um, I have another small uh, question. Uh, can I ask it now? Yeah, yes. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Now the, <clears throat> the puppies like toddlers, uh, they get hip dysplasia um, while they are, you know, six weeks, five weeks old. What we do is um, we uh, advise them to keep them in a rough floor, as I told you before. And same time, we take a sticking plaster, we use as a hobbler, uh, between right, uh, right tibia to left tibia. We kept the plaster and sticky teeth, and um, <clears throat> they automatically get recovered. Don't know whether um, you got the... Yeah, so again, I think it's, again, it's important not to, I would say it's very difficult to confirm a diagnosis of hip dysplasia per se in dogs that are just five to six weeks of age. They may have a gait abnormality that may be due to a developmental um, hip problem or not. Um, so that's one comment that I would make. Um, secondly, I think that, you know, things like hobbles have to be used very, very carefully because um, one, they've actually been shown to really, to, they can cause quite a lot of damage in terms of skin wounds and things like that. But also you might be addressing one problem and coming up with another problem. So personally, I would stick to a more evidence-based approach where uh, again, you're looking at you know, who the puppy you're treating. Is it a large breed puppy? What diet is it on? What sort of exercise plan is it on? And focus on those things. Um, I would probably stay away from using things like hobbles. Um, and again, you know, looking to sort of move forward rather than looking at individual cases, trying to be a bit more evidence-based in the way we look at things and using, you know, trying to focus on things that we actually have evidence for. Again, thinking about the traffic light system, using things that we have evidence for before trying other things that would be my kind of take on that. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Okay. 
Great, thanks everyone. Um, I'm happy to take any questions via email at any point. So um, feel free to message me if you've got anything further to ask. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Mahika, as you said, she's open for any questions by email as well. So you can uh, get anything after the session. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mahika, for that uh, amazing presentation. Also uh, clarifying uh, some of these important questions that uh, oh. had. Well, uh, I think that uh, concludes the um, 21st uh, session, the, the, the webinar on, on uh, conducted by the SLVA on canine hip dysplasia, diagnosis and treatment. Well, to mark the conclusion formally, I shall invite the secretary of the Sri Lanka Veterans Association, Dr. Subha Chandra, to present the vote of thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chandrindu. Good evening, Puner, the president of Sri Lanka Veterans Association, Dr. Patricia Tavan, the president of our association, Dr. Mahika Senna, our resource person today, Professor Charles, our uh, guest speaker, dear uh, teachers, dear veterinarians, ladies and gentlemen. I am delighted to say that we have conducted 21 webinars up to now. It was very successful. SLVA CBD webinar series is not only for veterinarians. It is for all the veterinarians in the world. In this webinar series, we conducted lectures on public communication, veterinary cardiology, crucial ligament surgery, bovine and small ruminant medicine, poultry health manage and management, common fish diseases and treatment, echocardiography, all about masses, tumors, Australian derivate experience, parrot diseases and treatment, squirrel diseases and treatment, milking on kiwis green pasture, patella surgery, common rabbit diseases and treatment, equine and surgery, biliary surgical emergencies, latest update rabies, one health approach, and keep dysplasia diagnosis and management. I hope we covered all, most all the important areas and we uh, telecasted it through SLV YouTube channel. For those who uh, joined the live webinar, they can watch it later. On behalf of Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, I take this opportunity to extend our most sincere gratitude to Dr. Mahika Saniviratna and Professor Charles who accepted our invitation as resource persons despite their busy schedule. We believe that the knowledge we have shared will help immensely in the improvement of skills of veterinary surgeons in the world. As, as well as I take this opportunity to thank all the resource persons who shared their knowledge uh, us throughout the SLBA CPD webinar series. I would like to express gratitude to Dr. Patricia Turner, the president of World Association, and Dr. C. Noga, secretary, World Veteran Association, for their special support to success SLBA CPD webinar series. And also, we are grateful to our moderator today, Dr. Tanguy Gabekon. Thank all the veterinarian and the student from the different part of the world who participated today to make this workshop a success. Thank you. So thank you everyone. That marks the end of today's session. And we hope to, Silvi is hoping to bring another set of web series, perhaps the time to come. Thank you very much and have an amazing